took it on today. Oh man, I got some old English dog. more beers and I spilled half the damn thing because I knocked it off my table. Oh shit. An idiot. Oh shit. That was, maybe that was a good thing because by the end of the, even the half one I had left I was I was pretty sideways bro. <laughs> You're like going oh man what have I done to myself. Yeah if I drank the rest of that the room might have been spinning. I'm not trying to ever get that drunk again. Dude uh people don't realize like 140 of old English is a six pack of regular yeah. beer. Oh, and, and you drink it like, oh, you're not thinking twice about it. You know, you're just right. like, oh, I'm chilling. No big deal. Every one beer you're drinking, you're drinking two. Man. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Giving some thanks and thoughts. You were, you were talking about some stuff earlier that, you know, uh got an interesting guest coming up and all about, you know, psychology of cults and everything and, Dude, I remember you talking all throughout the time I've known you about uh, Crossroads and your crazy experience with that whole organization. And uh, I got to be honest, man, I, I'm really, really intrigued about, you know, your backstory with the whole thing. So why don't you tell everyone, like, a little bit about it and your, your kind of experience? Well, um, the program, as it becomes known um, to all the members that were in it, um, is a very hard thing to explain to, to almost anyone that wasn't actually a part of it. And I guess that's the same way with probably any cult you could join or be a part of. Because in a lot of ways, it's completely dissociated from uh, regular people's lives and realities. Um, so the program was a sobriety, uh, a sobriety organization, okay, um, that spanned over the at that point in time it spanned over four different states which were georgia you had missouri and st louis and they, they i think they they have branched out to kansas city and columbia now and then you had colorado and arizona um and at that point in time the the main group had was in um was in phoenix arizona and uh so when I joined the program, I was like 15 years old, all right? And to be honest, I, I, you, by, by no stretch of the imagination could you consider me a drug addict at, at 15 years old. Um, now, had I smoked pot before? Yeah, I would smoked weed. I had tripped acid one time. Um... And I had, you know, and I, when I said smoke weed, I mean, like, probably counted on two, you know, maybe ten times, maybe, at that point in time. And I had drank, um, I had drank uh, quite a few times, like, I don't know, but probably under 20 times in my life. You know, it wasn't like, uh, wasn't like I was getting fucked up every day. It wasn't like, uh, the crazier thing is I was still in school at that point in time. And it wasn't until I got into the, 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 the recovery program until my school started failing. Um, and I started missing a lot of school because, well, basically because of the program, you know, <clears throat> you get indoctrinated into, um, you could only hang out with people that were in the program. Um, wow. yeah, you could only hang out with people in the program. And, uh, I mean, that's the definition of a cult, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Encapsulate and uh, take you away from everybody else. And they had placed it under the guise that you'll get messed up if you're hanging out with anyone else except for the program. And so you, you get in this thing. And the, the way they get you in is if you're a guy, everyone's giving each other hugs and telling each other they love you. Right. But you're a teenager... And you're getting to hug a lot of great looking girls. <laughs> you're getting to hug a lot of great looking girls. And so like these things start seeping in, 
know what I mean? These things start, you know, because like my first day there, like I barely said anything to anyone. All right. I kind of went through the thing. So is it like the 12 step program or it's what a 12, was it? It's a 12 step program, except for they change one of the steps and the way they change it. They, they, they change a lot of nuances in the steps is what they do is, uh, um, I, I have, I have, uh, turned my life over to a higher power in order to, you know, turn my will over to it. Cause I realize I'm powerless over, you know, my own actions. Well, somewhere in there, they convince you that the group itself is your higher power, that the group itself is your higher power. Do they it's, pass around Kool-Aid drinks or? No, no, no. But you get the hugs from all the cute girls that you, you saw in school. Right. You know what I mean? And they got con jobs. That and extra layer. It's that extra layer of uh, entrapment and encirclement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it, it plays on your insecurities in, in ways that, I mean, you're a teenager. I, I was 15. Right. I had just turned 15. And so all of a sudden you're getting hugged by all these girls. All of a sudden you're, you know what I mean? Uh, you're, you're told you're loved by everybody. All of a sudden, um, especially you're, you're taught to, whenever you become, you're in a group for, for longer than just, you know what I mean? The, the startup period, you're taught to reach out as part of your, uh, of your recovery. And so it becomes your job to help keep newcomers around giving back, doing something good, giving back to your little community. Gotcha. And in reality, what you're doing is you're help generating, them, you're help generating them more leads to send those people to treatment, get their, their parents to shell out, you know, seven, 10, $20,000 for treatment. Woo. Yeah. And, and the craziest part about it is, is that as you go through this, and like I told you, I was really quiet and everything at first, and that was my whole personality. The place changed my personality. I eventually became way more outgoing and way more excitable to fit that. And I would try to do it more than anybody else to kind of fit the mold of somebody, um, someone useful to the group, someone who was a part of the group, you know. And you're gaslighted like crazy. Like, uh, dude, the counselors would tell you you were lying about shit you weren't even lying about. And eventually, like, you would agree, oh, yeah, I'm fucked up. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, um, they, they break you down. You know what I mean? You're in these constant counselor sessions, and they, they break you down. They break you down. Like, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're dishonest about something, bro. You're dishonest about something. You know what I mean? Wow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And day in and day out, you're, and if you go to the treatment, you know what I mean? Day in, day out, that's, that's what you're going through every day, every fucking day. Okay. And you can't fix, which is hook somebody up with drugs. You can't fight in the group. You know what I mean? And you can't fuck. I repeat the last one. Can't fuck. You can't get into any relationship either unless it's sanctioned by the group. Whoa. Yeah, you can't get into any relationship unless it's sanctioned by the group. I say you want a drink. And Take a sip. think about that for a second. You already can't hang out with anybody outside of the group. Right. So not only you can't get into a relationship with somebody outside of the group, you can't get in one until they sanction it inside the group. So. I had not shed at 15. And I was in for two and a half years. Jesus. So yeah, you're, you're, you're in this fucking group and everyone's like, uh, you notice right off the bat, right off the bat, like I told you how they tell you to reach out. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? After you've been in the group for a while, they teach you to reach out to all the newcomers. You know what I mean? Right. You're, it's your job to fucking, you know, these guys are going to be your friends in the future. It's your job to, to reach out for these, with these people. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. You're responsible. So when I first get into the program, Okay. Um, the first person who reaches out to me is this guy named Scott Ott. Okay. And it was like him and, and another guy, his name's, his name was Pat. Okay. Um, 
were the first two people to really reach out to me. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Wait, let me let me go ahead and drop this bomb, right? The very first person to reach out to me whenever I got in the group was neither one of those people, now that I think about it. It was Kevin Shutt. I know, that was probably a fucking holy shit moment for you. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and he left the group probably, like, within my first two months. And, uh, the, uh, but my second, my set, my, my, my first weekend in the group, okay, um, Scott comes up to me, we went and watched movies at, like, Cinema 18, off Highway 94 in St. Charles, Missouri, all right, and we go to, we go to Cinema 18, and we watch whatever fucking movie, and we played some fucking video games or something stupid, you know what I mean, um, and Scott's like, uh, Scott gets together with another guy, his name's Mike, and, uh, he's like, dude, Come stay the come stay the night at my house. You know what I mean? He's like, it'll be fucking fun. We'll fucking we'll stay up all night. We'll do crazy fucking sober people shit. We we I leave with Scott. And he he lived in North County in the Natural Bridge area before it was like as bad as it is now. And uh, we get in this fucking vehicle, and it's like the middle of fucking winter. It's in January, and we get in this fucking vi- vehicle. And he, he tells us we're going to go fucking love bomb people. Okay? And I'm like, what the bomb. fuck is that? What the fuck are you talking about? And so we get a fucking list of all the addresses for all the chicks in the fucking group. And we literally go and fucking leave. I don't even remember what all we fucking did, but it was fucking insane. We like uh, left like like letters or notes and shit on like every fucking chick in this fucking group's door, all right, in the middle of the fucking night like psychos. Um, yeah. <clears throat> like fucking psychos. That shit will get your restraining order nowadays. Yeah, it's a whole different world now. You know what I mean? We're talking about the '90s. Uh, it's a whole different world now. Um, but yeah, so we go out and do that, and that's just the first night. I stayed the whole weekend at this dude's house. All right. And now the next day, um, we go hang out with a bunch of people and we're playing this game called biscuit tag. It's literally like drive by shootings with biscuits. (laughs) We're like, okay. You remember going into Whitmore, right? Yeah. We drove through Whitmore like Mad Max. And there was like five, like seven different carloads of fucking people. Throwing biscuits out the window at each other's cars. Going like 40 miles an hour, 40 to 50 miles an hour in a neighborhood. While wow. people on the ground threw fucking snowballs at the cars. This is just my first weekend in this group, and I'm like, wow, these people are fucking crazier than people on drugs. Yeah. I wouldn't even fucking think to do shit like that on drugs. Man, I'm way too lazy. Um. But yeah, dude, these fucking, you know, so all this crazy stuff happens. I don't get hardly any sleep. And then like, uh, I go back to my parents' house. You know what I mean? So like, uh, that's just like a description of like what the program was, what it was kind of, so they get you, they get you in by telling you that sobriety could be more fun than getting fucked up. Yeah. Um, the, the goal is to get you in treatment. You know what I mean? Which sounds great. You know what I mean? But at this point in time. None of the treatment was accredited. Right. Um, it's all psychological gaslighting. And from... They they would convince you that if you ever left the... Pro- and you're told this every day. Man. And you hear people repeat it. That's the crazy... You start hearing the people repeat it. And every time you say something a hundred times, it's permanently imprinted in your mind. So you would get things like... Uh, you would hear... Um, Man, if, if you ever go back out there, you're going to be ten times as fucked up as you were whenever you, you know, uh, were out there last time. Man, if you go back out there, you're going to rob people. Man, if you go out back out there, you know, you're going to hurt people. Wow. You repeatedly told us. So it sticks in your head. It sticks in your head for a long time. And so, like, that's the only way that I thought whenever I got, well, fuck, man, I got to fuck people over and shit. I was, you know, it becomes your first thought. And then, like, you have to start reprogramming. Like, no, that's not me. And you got to start telling yourself, like, no, that's not you. That's just what they told you. 
Yeah. You know, that's just what they told you. Like, that's not anything to do with you. But they repeatedly tell you and tell you and tell you and tell you. So I go through the fucking program and I, I, I'm in there. I'm, I'm in there for, I think over a year. The first time I leave for like two months and then I come back. Yeah. Because what happens is, is since you, whenever you're in there, like you're not, you have no other friends. So it's either you ha try to hang out with people who used to be in the program or you, you, you don't know anybody anymore. They got you to shun everybody else. You're probably no longer in school by this point in time either. They get you to, they get you to fucking to leave school a lot of times or, or go to one of their, uh, they'll set some, one of the moms up to do homeschooling for everybody. So not only are you, you're in school with the same people as you're in these meetings with as that you can only hang out with in which you go to do these party functions in order to attract more people to this situation. Interesting. Um, I'm not bragging on myself, but before the time I had left, I became like the Scott out guy. You know what I mean? Like newcomers come in that were dudes. Like I'd invite everyone to crash at my place, um, for the weekend. You know what I mean? For the weekend, I became that guy. You know what I mean? Right. So everybody I'm came. Yeah. Everybody came to my house now. You know what I mean? It was like, usually. And like we'd stay up and play play fucking Risk and video games and all a bunch of Japanese titles that no one could get a hold of, um, <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's people who tell stories, still tell stories. If they run into me, they're like, "Yo, I remember playing fucking a Dragon Ball Z game that was for like Sega Saturn back in 2000, you know, like like 1998. Yeah. You know, it was amazing. I don't even know what we were doing, and uh." So I become this guy and I really start becoming disillusioned with the place. I'm 17 and a half. You know what I mean? Turn 18 in six months. And I'm like, man, I'm 17 years old. And I start, I start dating this chick. Yeah. All right. I start, I get, I get clearance. The, the, the problem is, is that like, uh, this chick was a really good friend of mine, but I didn't, I don't think I, I, I wanted to date her out of, uh, like I liked her like that. You know what I mean? I think I wanted to date her out of the fucking fact that I, I could date someone. And so we went on our first date and she's actually, you know, so you would go on three dates and then you would ask somebody if they wanted to be your, it's so ritualistically weird. Okay. Yeah. And then you would be able to ask them if they wanted to be your girlfriend or whatever. You know what I mean? And just a whole bunch of weirdness. And you had to do all these ritualistic fucking things, you know, give them flowers and all this other shit. And, you know, uh, all these things that don't always all happen in the real world. You know what I mean? The real dating world. You know, you do the flower thing. Like, if you really like a chick, you do the flower thing. If you really, you know, it's a special, you know what I mean? But like, uh, dating is not really rich, as ritualistic as it used to be. You know what I mean? But they would make it as ritualistic as possible. Um, and so after the first date, I was like, man, this is, this isn't for me. Okay. Yeah. And so you have what's called a sponsor. It's, uh, the person who sponsors your sobriety. Okay. Um, and you go to them for advice and they give you guidance and everything else. Well, I basically, I go to my sponsor and he's like, he goes, after you do this date thing, I already know you're getting on steering committee. All right. And I'm like, what? And, uh, so steering committee is like, there, there's these different tiers of, of progress you make in this thing. All right. So you start out as just this person who comes in and then you wind up being able to sponsor people. And yeah, I could, I could do all that. And. You know, uh, you get to go through and, you know, to be a part of the program. Well, then it moves forward, you know what I mean? You got this next tier that, that's called steering committee. And they have private meetings on Saturday with the counselors. Okay, and they basically figure out what, what everybody's going to do for the next week. Yeah. 
All right, like all the functions, like the functions on Friday and Saturday, which were like mini parties or get-togethers or, you know, like they, we might throw a party at somebody's house. You might go all play mini golf. You might go fucking uh, do a scavenger hunt over the city. You might go do, you know, who fucking knows. Um. And so like your so your life ritual like this, it's it's just fucking. But. I tell my sponsor, I'm like, dude, I don't want to ask her on a second date. I don't think it's right. I don't, I don't feel this. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't, this isn't me. And I get told that I have to do this. Whoa. I get told I have to. I have to ask this chick out on a second date. And I'm just like, and I'd seen some shit before. You know what I mean? Like, and some shit had happened before. And I'm like. I'm like, this is, this is fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, uh, this doesn't make sense at all. Like, why, why am I, why am I doing this? You know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, dude, you'll, you'll, you know, you, you've lost a ton of weight. You fucking this, you've done this. You know what I mean? Um, all your shit's cool and checked out. And, uh, he's like, uh, do you just have to go through with this and ask her out? Yeah. And so I do it. And I get turned down like a motherfucker. And I'm like, I already knew what was going to, like, I, I just, it didn't, you know what I mean? Nothing clicked. You know, I, I already, I already knew, like, it just didn't click. Um, and I'm not, I'm not bummed out because like, I'm not, go I didn't want to go on a second date with this girl, even though this chick is, I know her to, to this day and she's cool as fuck. You know what I mean? Um, Really great person. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the whole deal. Like, amazing person. Really cool. Um, I really liked her parents. Like, her parents were always really cool to me. Um, but, yeah. Like, me and her already knew that that wasn't going to... You know what I mean? And so, it like, it, it opened me up in my mind to, like, all the dis disillusionment, though. Like, I walked into the situation. I had to do this in order to get this figmative thing, you know what I mean, carrot of other things, you know what I mean, you know what I mean, in my life, because they, they basically condition you where everyone thinks they want, that they can be on staff someday. So your goal, almost from the onset of when you're sober, becomes working towards improving their program that generates them money, that it will one day be your job. Let me repeat. They get children to come into a group that's supposed to get them sober with the idea of keeping more people around because this will one day be your job. Wow. I mean, it's crazy. It's some, uh, it's some next level, uh, scandaloso. Now I can only imagine and think about this. I can only imagine what it was like to be a staff member because like, I mean, I've heard the rumors and paid? stories. Yes, they do. But like nothing, you know what I mean? Like they get into this and now they're, they're working for peanuts. You know what I mean? Um, usually when most of them people got in, like they're, they're living in fucking like, like a house with five guys and a house with five chicks. You know what I mean? Those, that's staff, you know, um, upper senior staff would eventually, you know what I mean? Like they'd have their own house, houses and shit. You know what I mean? Their own places. But like, uh, I remember, uh. I mean, there's some nightmare stories about, uh, so one, one of the other really bad things about the group was, uh, they'd always make it seem like if you hadn't done too fucked up a shit, they would, let me, let me rephrase that. It's like everyone tried to one up everybody on stories about getting fucked up and the people that had gotten more fucked up than other people we're better off than the, the rest of everyone else. Like if I, a crossroads, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. So you would get like uh you would get kids that would dude, I didn't lose my virginity until I was like 17. But dude, like uh like yeah, like after I gotten out of the maybe 18, fuck. Cuz I was basically in a fucking I'm still a virgin. <laughs> Yeah, tell that to Thailand. When's it going to be my time, man? It's gonna... <laughs> we are now putting out a... waiting. It's working out really well. We're now putting out a uh, APB for anybody who wants to sleep with Jimmy. Um, all points bulletin on anybody who is... Uh, send, send picks. <laughs> uh, with bobs and vagines. You know, send bobs and vagine picks uh, to James... Kopechny, um, P.O. Box, uh, 911 Turbo, Porsche Street, fucking 63376. But yeah, like, uh, so yeah, man, like, uh, and then eventually, like, you're like, well, fuck, man, what's even the point? <laughs>